You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas, and here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services, your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. And today I have a recurring, a returning um, priest who is a musician and a member of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And that's Father Lawrence Tucker. And so he's going to talk to us about some Christian music and also about some writing. So welcome, Father. How are you? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Tulin. I'm doing uh, great. Thanks be to God. I'm here on Long Long Island, uh, where I basically come from. And uh, I just finished up five months of mission appeals, crossing the whole country doing mission appeals. And now I have a little time. Since I'm in, the, since I ended up the uh, the mission fields in Boston, I have an opportunity to uh, visit my family and friends on Long Island. So, anyway, uh, it's a it's a great blessing to be on the show with you today to share uh, a little bit about our new single. You know, brother sister is the name of my band, mm-hmm. and uh, we had an album out called So Shine. And now we're releasing singles, and so not too long ago, I was on your show talking about our first single, which um, was called uh, The Main Part. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new single out called As a Gift. And uh, so for your audience, I thought what I would try to do, I've not really done this before, but let's see how it works. I have my laptop all set up, and I'm going to play as a gift, play the song so that the audience will know, you know, what we're talking about. And the, just a brief uh, introduction. The song is just about how our lives are a gift and everything in our lives, everybody in our lives are, uh, are a gift. And we don't want to uh, lose sight of that because it's, it's really very easy to lose a sense of how we're just immersed in our Father's gifts. So this song is speaking to that whole reality. So I'm going to just hold my phone towards the laptop. It has, it has a couple of speakers. Hopefully it'll, it'll work. We'll see. This is mm-hmm. a little experiment here, but let's see how it goes. Okay. okay I'm, going to, I'm going to start the song, Dr. Tulin. Okay. Okay, hang on one second. I had it on uh, on the speakers, on the headphones, I mean. Okay, here we go. Okay. Thank you. 
So, Dr. Tulin, um, yes. how did that work? How did that sound uh, I think for you? It sounded good. Um, okay. I really like the lead singer's voice there. Oh, yeah. That's Deirdre Broderick. She is so, I mean, her voice is so beautiful and such a, such a, a full melodic uh, voice where she's just, it's just wonderful. So mm-hmm. real blessing to have her. She's, she's not only the vocalist, uh, Dr. Tulin, she's the producer. She has a, oh. a professional state-of-the-art studio right in her home, mm-hmm. in, her, in her house. And um, she's a keyboard expert, you know, piano, organ, whatever. And uh, she also is incredible on the bass guitar. I, I mean, she's, She's as good as any bassist, I think, anyone has ever heard. And yeah. but she's just a musical genius, really. That's what I call her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She, she doesn't, I don't know if, it, if she sees herself in that light, but I certainly do, and I think many other musicians do. And mm-hmm. she can do it all. She's like Prince. I don't know if you heard of the rocker, yeah. you know, Prince, yeah. but yeah. I had a studio in his home, and he did all the instruments, and I played lead guitar, rhythm guitar, keyboards, drums, he sang, he composed his songs, he recorded them. Picture is like that. She can do the whole thing. She's a, a one-man band, as they used to say. Yeah. So, yeah, she's a real blessing, uh, Dr. Tolan. Yeah, that, that is nice um, to have someone who's that talented working with you. Oh, what a blessing. And then she is so gifted, you know, she does... Um, she does play, she does musicals. There's a, you may have heard it, uh, being from the Northeast, you may have heard that in Manhattan, there's a, a very famous, probably the most prominent youth theater company and production company and such that it's called Tada, you know, T-A-D-A, kind of like, you know, Tada, you know, and, yeah. and uh, she has done two musicals, at least two musicals for them that are very popular, really going well. One is called Odd Days Rain, and the other is called The Perfect Monster. So she's done all the music, and her whole life, her whole musical life, she's done film scores and such. She has her own beautiful music on her website. But because of her musical uh, expertise and gifts, she has been able to bring into the band some of the finest musicians alive, one of them being David Spinoza, who mm-hmm. is just, I'm, I mean, if I started talking about David and his expertise and his, he's a virtuoso guitarist, he can play classical guitar, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, any kind of guitar. He's as good as the best who have ever played the instrument. Uh, he's a friend of Deirdre. She brings him in. He, he's, on the, he's in the band. And then you have Frank Dickinson. You know he's one of the best percussionists alive, and uh, performing and playing and recording in the world today. And so I have all of these people in my band, uh, and uh, it's just the work of God. It's just God's providence uh, providing for uh, music that we believe and we're hoping will be uh, music that will. Uh, be in accord with the new evangelization that the church is trying to affect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that uh, that really is a blessing, and um, her voice is uh, so smooth. You know, it's like it's she gets the point across. She's loud enough. You know, sometimes women can't project as well, and yeah. uh, but it's a very soothing sound. So. She's a yeah, she she's, is. She she's is. a keeper, as we used to say. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. So <laughs> uh, that's so true. She really is. People have commented on her voice, how she's always on note. It's always a a full, uh, believable. You know, for the songs that I'm writing, uh, Doctor Tulin, as I said, they're they're songs that come from from within, and I believe they come from my communion uh, with God, and I write these songs, I write the songs pretty much in the same way that an iconic, an iconic, I'm, I'm, forgive me, someone who, who paints icons, mm-hmm. um, the way that they prepare and to paint the icon traditionally is that they do it in an atmosphere of prayer. They pray and pray and pray and then 
they have kind of an inspiration for the icon, and then they paint the icon in this sort of immersion in prayer. Well, I do the same thing with my songs. And so these songs, uh, they're, they're very uh, spiritualized. And so the person who's going to do the vocal, the person who's going to sing the song, it needs to be someone who can uh, sing in a way that is convincing, in a full voice, it, because really what you're doing is you're proclaiming something. You're proclaiming a spiritual message. And it can't be sort of done in a half-hearted way. It has to be pro- uh, projected and uh, proclaimed, really. It's a, it's, a, it's a message. It's a gospel message. It's a spiritual message. And so, by the grace of God, Deirdre is the one who is doing that. And so, uh, mm-hmm. that's, uh, you know, that's really the blessing that comes for, uh, for the music. And you can see it. You can hear it very well in the song I just played, As a Gift, which is a song about how we live in our Father's gifts. You know, a person who doesn't believe, and of course there, is many of them, there are many of them out there, unfortunately. This used to be a country with uh, just the majority of the people were believers, but now that's changed dramatically. But for a person who doesn't believe, well, that person... Uh, lives in the world. But for a person who does believe, we live, as believers, we live in our Father's gifts. And so, you know, that's what the song is addressing, is that even though the world around us has changed quite a bit, our culture, our society has uh, changed in not a very favorable way, nevertheless, we live in our Father's gifts. And so that's the song. The song is trying to remind us that Everything we have, that's one of the lines, everything we have has been given. You know, your home, and I know that you just had a, kind of an adventure with your home, but <laughs> with the ice machine breaking but, and causing a flood. But, you know, and, and, but then you pointed out that to me before the, before the, uh, before the interview was that mm-hmm. even in the midst of this semi-disaster, the flood in your home, there was a blessing, you know? And so, you know, we live in our Father's gifts. Everything we have has been given. uh, And if we recognize that, you know, that your life, your home, your family, your friends, you know, all of these things are blessings from above, from your Father in, in the fullness of his love. So when you recognize that, you realize that, those blessings, those gifts call forth from within the believer, from the, from the daughter or the son of God. It calls forth this spirit where you just naturally want to give it all back to your father. Mm-hmm. And that's the life of the Trinity, Dr. Tillman, as you well know. You know the yes. father gives everything to the son, and then the son gives everything back to the father. This is all takes place in the spirit. The Father's gifting of the Son with us, for example, mm-hmm. the, the Son presents us back to the Father in the spirit. And so it's, this is a whole Trinitarian life that we're drawn into, that we live. But you're not going to know about this whole Trinitarian movement, this whole Trinitarian grace, Unless you recognize all these gifts, everything is a gift from your Father. And so that's what the psalm is trying to point out and to remind people. You know, because during this time of pandemic, it is so easy to lose perspective and to lose sight of the fact that it doesn't matter. We could be living through the Black Plague. It doesn't matter. We are still immersed in our Father's gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right. That's something that um, that people do need to be reminded of. Um, we just get overwhelmed not only with things like COVID, but we just get overwhelmed with our daily lives, you know, and, you know, working and coming home and cooking and that sort of thing. So oh, yeah. um, it is something that we constantly need to be reminded of. Isn't it true? Uh, it's Our world today is just so busy 
You know, yeah. it's just every time you turn around, there's another appointment, there's another this or that. And uh, it's funny because we, 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 we like to think of our world as a world that's filled with modern conveniences that science and technology have bestowed upon us. And, and so we have all of these conveniences that are supposed to make life so much easier and, 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 and we're supposed to have, you know, this abundance of leisure time because of all of these incredible discoveries, inventions, developments. And yet, if you ask the average person, hey, you know, why don't we, oh, I'm so busy, I, I can't possibly get together with you, you know, mm-hmm. you know my calendar. Yeah, it's just where it doesn't seem to be working, you know, even with all of these time-saving conveniences and what have you, people are still very stressed out and very overwhelmed. They don't have time to, to breathe, to think. You know, so often as a priest, uh, Dr. Tuma, I'll be talking with people and sometimes I'll say, you know, uh, so I'm just curious, you know, how, how is your prayer life? What, how, how do you pray, you know? And uh, they'll say, oh, gosh, prayer, Father? Oh, I don't, have, I don't have any time for prayer. I mean, I'm lucky I go to church on Sunday. And then I remember what Mother Teresa said. If you're too busy to pray, well, you're just too busy. Yeah. That's you know? The truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. That's definitely the truth. Isn't it, though? So, anyway, um, that's the song, uh, As a Gift, and uh, your listeners can uh, find it. You know, very easily on uh, at the brother sister dot net. You know, all lowercase one word brother sister dot net, and you can find all of my music there. And uh, you know, just one other reflection on um, on as a gift, uh, Dr. Tulin. You'll notice that, uh, and at the brother sister dot net, you can also get the lyrics. But uh, Deirdre's voice is so clear and articulate that I don't think anyone will have any problem. Any problem, you know, understanding the, the words as she sings them. But mm-hmm. in, in any case, uh, I tried to bring out, or I was inspired to bring out in the song, in a very special way, in a very pointed way, how all of creation, all of the beautiful things that our Father has given us to live in, you know, we live in, in an environment, a natural environment, that was created by our Father. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and all of it, the air, you know, one of the lines is the air you breathe, you receive. You know, the air, all of the plant life, one of the words is, and the flowers grow because they know they're a gift. I'm not, you know, that's poetic, right? I'm not saying the flowers are conscious mm-hmm. and you actually know anything. But, right. uh, but you would almost, I mean, if you look at them, you'd almost think that they do. You know, the way that they're so beautiful and the way they display themselves for us. And so I try to, uh, being in sync with uh, Pope Francis's love of creation and St. Francis's love for creation, I'm trying to be in sync with where the church is at right now, trying to draw attention to the fact that our beautiful world, this, this, this incredible jewel among the planets, as far as we know, there's no planet like this planet, none that we have ever found mm-hmm. uh, that is so filled with natural beauty and, and life, just, it, it's just bursting at the seams with living things. And all of this is a gift bestowed upon, you know, well, creation itself is, is a gift that all the natural things enjoy in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. But we live in a wonderland of our Father's li- gifts, of all of these beautiful things, you know, that, the flowers, the plants, the trees, the, the, the sky, the rivers, the ocean. In fact, the song starts out with, and this was Deirdre's inspiration. You know, I write the song, but then I leave it in Deirdre's hands uh, to, she works in the spirit as well. And so I leave it to her to interpret and to arrange. And she is just a marvel, just a, a creative artist like I've never seen before. So the song starts out with the beautiful sound, the tranquil sound of the ocean waves breaking on the shore. And then comes in the, uh, this little sort of organ sound and then another sound complementing it. And, and then it just moves into the, 
into the song itself, meaning the, the vocals, you know, the lyrics and mm-hmm. such. And the whole song is just this, it's really a tranquilizer. People who have written to me, who have listened to the song said, Father, I could listen to the song over and over for an hour, and it would be for me just a most beautiful meditation and a beautiful, restful sort of experience because of the tranquility and the beauty of the music. Yes. I you know, agree. so it's yes, and so that whole you know trying to plug into the where the church is at, uh, trying to draw people's attention to these beautiful gifts of God that we're surrounded by that you know we really need to uh, to preserve and to be careful of how we use or God uh, help us abuse in some way that we have to have a whole new attitude towards trying to preserve this beautiful, beautiful gift of, of the planet Earth so that it's, it, we give it proper uh, respect and dignity so that everybody on the planet can enjoy uh, this wonderful gift for, for a long time. And then the second verse moves into the interior gifts that God blesses us with faith and peace and love and life itself. So hopefully, Dr. Tulin, people will will come to learn about the song uh, through this interview and uh, you know, through the website and mm-hmm. come to enjoy this beautiful music. Yeah, it's almost like it's, uh, it's it, to me, it's prayerful because we do need to be aware of these things and we need to be not only of the peace and the beauty and the fact that all of this is a gift, but it's, it's something that we need to be thanking God for. And, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so that's that's one of the things that I get from that music. Here, just one second. My my uh, computer has taken off on on, on the song. Just hang on a second. I don't know why it's doing that. Just hang on a second. Okay, okay. I got I got it to calm down. My my computer has a life of its own, apparently. But uh, don't they I'm all? sorry. I interrupted what you were saying. <laughs> They do, I tell you. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I'll tell you, things are something else. But, you know, here's a quote uh, from St. Benedict, I'm sorry, from St. Bernard, that I think sends, says a lot, really, and kind of ties into uh, what we were trying to do with, with, um, as a gift. So St. Bernard says, Believe one who has tried... You shall find a fuller satisfaction in the woods than in books. The trees and the rocks will teach that which you cannot get from the masters. Now, I mean, doesn't it say it all really when, with regard to the, our natural yeah. environment? That yeah. There is so much, there are so many messages that come to us through our Father's creation, you know, so, so many important, profound uh, messages of love and of mm-hmm. dignity and of beauty that come to us uh, in that way, you know. I agree. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, that we we are made to live in a natural environment, you know. And yeah. when you think of how we live now, I mean, there are people who live in condo complexes that are so big but they probably never see a tree unless they're on their way to work. You know, so there's no yeah. balance. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that we need to focus on, that lack of balance uh, between what oh, God has given so, Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Dr. Tulin, as a sociologist, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, I don't think truer words have ever been spoken that the way – human life in our modern times especially has been designed and human living uh, spaces like take the urban environments of, uh, of the average U.S. city. Well, look, we all know that what they really are, are are concrete and steel jungles. You know, they're just, they're just places that are so confusing with these giant buildings and a pavement everywhere. If it's not the uh, the macadam on the street, it's the, it's the cement on the giant sidewalks, and then you have buildings of concrete and steel, and the whole thing is just very, you know what I mean? It's just so anti, 
the human spirit. And so I think as, as our human family moves forward, we really have to rethink how human beings thrive and what's the best environment. You know, why did God give us uh, this uh, beautiful jewel of living things? I mean, we're surrounded by uh-huh. just the most beautiful living things. You know, if it isn't plant life, it's animal life, and it's everywhere. Why did he give it to us if we're uh, t- uh, going to live in concrete and steel, you know, mazes that we w- go through, you know, the grid of concrete and steel that we live in, we're surrounded by, and then the pollution that's in, uh, endemic in those places. You know, let's just take a message and, and, and take, a, um, take our cues from our father that, hey, you know what, <laughs> You'll do much better just living in, in, a, in a natural environment. You know, we don't have to go back in time and live like, you know, like a caveman or anything like that, but we, we need to recognize our, our need for natural beauty. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, more than going on vacation, you know, and that's, I think, what people think. It's, you know, we'll go out and we'll have a good time on vacation. We'll go for a drive, eat, you know. That's... Yes. That's not enough. It's too uh, intermittent. You know, it's like a week this year, maybe two next year. It's not a normal way to live. I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm against the kind of housing or the um, the technology. Much of the technology we have is very helpful, but um, it's just this total out of whack lack of balance that uh, that amazes me. I mean. There are yes. people that watch television or have the television on all the time or the radio all the time. I don't know how you think or pray or meditate in any way if all you have is electronic noise. But, yes. um, you know, so those, you know, as a sociologist, you're right. I, I notice how much the human race's life uh, quality of life or the way we live has changed even in the last, say, 100 years, maybe 125 years. Um, yes. It's, it's yes. entirely different. If you picked someone up from 1800 and dropped them in our century, they think we put them on Mars. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, like, uh, think of uh, there was a good show. I think the reruns are available somewhere, but Little House on the Prairie where mm-hmm. – in this country, uh, most of the people, and probably in Europe as well, you know, lived in the countryside. They were surrounded by their father's gifts. Their faith was uh, supported by uh, uh, living amidst, like you pointed out, not this intermittent uh, excursion into uh, into uh, the natural creation as if it was like a sideshow, mm-hmm. uh, but they were living in it, immersed in it, and uh, they were just breathing fresh air smelling the flowers and the natural plants, the pine trees and whatever on a daily basis. And, you know, we now know, and we can do this. I mean, human beings and the human family and the human community, we can do whatever we want. If we want to live amidst concrete and steel, we can do that. We've proven that. We're doing it now. But if we want to change that up uh, for a better life, a more integrated more holistic life. I mean, we're gravitating towards whole foods and such and organic and everything. But what about our living spaces, you know? So if we want to, with our great technology, if we want to use it to develop a way of living that is much more natural, I mean, how beautiful to live amidst all of our Father's gifts. And you know, Dr. Tulin, that is probably one of the reasons why many, many people do not have a sense of gift anymore. It's because we no longer live in these gifts that flow right from the heart of our Father. We live amidst things that were created by man. Now, not everything created by man is like absent of the realm of gift, but much of it is. And, and, and so, or let's just put it this way, there is a distinction between what we make and what our father makes. And, you know, what our father makes has a lot of healing qualities. You know, just think about the last time, well, you know, 
you may live in a, in a in a place. I don't know exactly where you live, but I'm assuming you live with uh-huh. you have a yard and trees and oh, stuff. Yeah. And you know, yeah. and so you know, you hear the birds and you see them and you see the various creatures and you have fresh air, uh, plants and such. You know, all of those things have healing qualities. Mm-hmm. You know, Thanks. and we're not tapping into that. We're tapping into actually quite the opposite. We're tapping into sounds and uh, aromas and things that do not have healing qualities. They actually make us stressed out and, and in some respects actually kind of disgust the aesthetic, uh, you know, dimension of our being. Like, you know, we're looking at buildings sometimes that are like so gross that we're like, oh my gosh, get me out of here, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and, and th- those things are not healing. They're actually kind of destructive at the psychological level and at the emotional level and certainly at the spiritual level. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm probably not even as positive about that as you are because uh, I had cancer a few years ago. And um, oh. I was told to eat a plant-based diet, um, not not in the sense of not having any meat but or eggs, milk, anything like that, certainly in moderation, but to primarily eat a plant-based diet. Um, now, that sound, you know, it's organic, it sounds good, but in fact, people are buying food that they think is organic that is not. So, for instance, you go to the freezer, you know, in the store, you buy black bean burgers, you buy chickpea burgers, veggie burgers. These are all 100% veggie, but they're full of chemicals to preserve them and an, un- wow. an unbelievable amount of salt. So you could make your own black bean burgers, right? I mean, that happens to be my favorite. Um, but then you have to get the, usually you get the black beans out of a can. Um, so again, you're dealing with salt and other preservatives. Or you can go yeah. to the store and buy black beans, you know, dried black beans, um, which takes so so long to to get them soft that it's almost not worth the effort. But um, even then, I'm not convinced there's not preservatives in them. It's not just drying. We don't know how they dry them. Um, So, you know, to me, what we're doing, it's not just that we live in a false environment. It's all you know, manufactured buildings and cement and all that. Uh, Very few, you know, very few landscape areas if you're going into a city. Even then, fertilizer, you know, all kinds of uh, anti-bug sprays. Then you go into your kitchen and you try to eat healthy. It's almost impossible. We're not just, we have actually, we're actually not only not recognizing, recognizing it as a gift, we're basically poisoning it. Yeah. So um, I agree. I mean, I think that it's a good thing that people are starting to think about things like organic food, um, that they're starting to think about, you know, what exactly is going on in the lawn. But, um, you know, it's it to me, it's much worse than most people actually realize. You know? Yes. Yes, you're right, Dr. Tone. I agree uh, 100% that, um, but, you know, we have a be- very uh, inspired, very beautiful uh, leader of our church right now, Pope oh, Francis, yes. and yes. he, along with, yeah, along with uh, many other religious leaders, but also along with many civic leaders, many uh, physicians, doctors, sociologists, and just the, the people in general, especially of our country, I believe there is a movement in the direction of, of recovering all of these beautiful gifts. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, natural foods. You know, I think there is uh, the science, the medicine has proven and shown that, look, there's no way to get around it. So many of these natural things are really not just good for human beings, but really necessary for the fullness of health and for the fullness of happiness, emotional health, et cetera, for human beings. Now look at the explosion <clears throat> of anxiety and depression that we have. Mm-hmm. Now, 
some of that uh, is due to the at the at the concomitant decline in faith, but also some of it is due to the fact that we're just not living the way we were. We were made to live. You know, we were made to live in a more natural, healthy way. And we're just not doing that because the whole society, the whole structure of the culture uh, is not bent in that direction. But we are now recognizing that. Yeah. It's almost escapable, you know. And so I believe, Dr. Tulin, that we're on the right path and we're heading in the right direction. And eventually we will get to the point where we're designing spaces for people to live in, you know, new communities, new uh, divisions and such, uh, you know, where it's going to be this beautiful balance where human beings will have what is truly uh, meant for them to reach their, to flourish. It's a very popular new term, but it's very, it's very good really to, it expresses the situation very well. Like, are we really flourishing now? Everyone's anxious. Everyone's on various medications. No, no, we're not really flourishing. And so it's been recognized, and I think the movement is going to correct that. And we're going to use all of the technology and all of the science that we have. Hopefully, uh, it's right now it seems to be uh, not being used uh, perfectly in that direction, but the tendency is to use it more and more in the direction of developing a sustainable, healthy planet and setting up living situations where human beings will, uh, will be the ones that sustain that healthy living planet. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, um, yeah, I think that we have a long way to go. Um, but I do think that we will get there. Um, yes. Hopefully. But it's going to take yes. a lot of effort. Um, yes. Well, that, this is, you know, as I write my music, as my band uh, and I, brother, sister, put together these songs, we have a lot of this in the back of our minds. And uh, I think uh, the song, As a Gift, <coughs> excuse me, is also uh, speaking to this reality that, uh, you know, this is the direction we want to go in. We want to go in the direction where we're living more conscious of our dignity, of who we are, in relation to our Father, in relation to one another, and in relation to the gifts of our Father, uh, uh, mainly, uh, well, not mainly, but uh, one of the foremost gifts is the natural creation. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, all the other gifts would be uh, the personal gifts, the interior gifts of spiritual life and such. And so as we put this all together and move forward, I think that you're going to see uh, just a, a very promising future, which, which sounds kind of contrary to the state of things, right? You know, the pandemic, when is it going to end, you know? And so here you have this priest, this missionary saying, no, it's, a, it's actually a very promising future. You know, we're going to get there. But I do believe that, and I think Pope Francis believes that as well. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that I'll live to see it. Um, you know, because I think that before you can actually entirely turn things around, you have to stop the uh, move in the wrong direction. And I think a lot of people are trying to do that now. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, you know, to turn things around, um, even in a country the size of the United States, leave alone globally, I bet would take at least a century. Yes. Yes. You know, Dr. Tulin, a thought just came to me, uh, and since I have my computer up, mm -hmm. we're talking about giftedness and, uh, and gifts, you know, and um, we're talking about spiritual gifts as well. Well, I have a song that I'd like to uh, play and introduce your, your listeners to. It's called Sor, S-O-R, it's a Spanish word, Sor Maria de Agreda, and it's about the story of the so-called lady in blue. And uh, the song is, uh, well, when I wrote the song, I wrote the song about 10 years ago, but we just recorded it about two years ago. But um, the song is about 
Mary of Agreda, that's how you would say it in English. And in Spanish, you would say Maria de Agreda. And um, I wrote the song because at the time I wrote it, there was not a single song in English about this venerable. She's, uh, she has not been beatified or canonized yet, but her, she's venerable, so her name in the church would be Venerable Mary of Agreda. Or you could just Google Lady in Blue and she'll come up. Uh, that's, her, that's the name that the indigenous peoples of the Southwest gave her because in the 16th century, she bilocated from Agreda, Spain. She was a contemplative Franciscan sister, and she was a member of, uh, of a contemplative community called uh, the Concepcionistas in Spanish, the Concepcionistas. And, um, and so she bilocated. She had this wonderful gift of bilocation. She bilocated from Agreda to the southwest of the United States before the Spaniards were there, before the Spanish mis missionaries or colonists arrived in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California. Before they arrived there to evangelize the native population, uh, Venerable Mary of Agreda bilocated there and did the pre-evangelization of various indigenous peoples. And so she arrived. It's an incredible story. And many, many Catholic, Catholics in this country do not know the story. But it's just the most marvelous story of this sister who was so spiritualized, so saintly, that God gave her this mission and uh, gave her this gift of bilocation, which, granted, we don't know much about it. We really don't understand it. It's Right. Of all the gifts, you know, it's just so incredible, you know. It, but really, do we even understand levitation? I mean, there are many, no. many saints of the medieval times <laughs> had the gift of levitation. How, how do we explain that? I mean, we don't. No one can explain it. It just happens. And mm -hmm. so the gift of bilocation is like that, but even a little bit more complex because it seems like what happens is that the person is – actually in two places at one time. But we now know from studies in mystical theology and such that, that chances are it isn't actually that the person is in the two places at one time, but it's probably more like the person is sort of sending the, the, sort of an image of themselves or something like that to the other place. So it is by location, but is it, can, it, can it be explained as being, actually being in two places at one time? No one really knows, so it's, it's, it's mysterious, and uh, it's going to probably end up uh, being one of those things in our church, which we know it happens from time to time, but we don't completely understand it. Right. But in any case, this is, uh, her case of by location is the best documented case of bilocation in the history of the church. You know, Padre Pio is uh, mm -hmm. supposed to have bilocated, and, uh, but even the document documentation for that is not as solid as the documentation for Venerable Mary of Agreda. But in any case, so here she is in, in the monastery in Agreda, Spain, and she's praying, and all of a sudden she finds herself in the southwest of the United States, uh, before it was even colonized by the Southwest, the, by the Spaniards, you know, before it was New Spain. Mm -hmm. And so there she is, and she's amongst these indigenous people, and she's speaking their language, and she's teaching them the rosary. She's teaching them about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. She's teaching them about the crucifixion of our Savior, Jesus. And so she appeared to so many tribes so often that, they gave her this name. They called her the Lady in Blue because um, she wore her habit, which was uh, essentially uh, like a blue habit. And so uh, they called her the Lady in Blue. And, uh, and so she uh, did this pre-evangelization. And how it became known to the Franciscans was that when the Franciscans finally 
arrived in Texas and at the area that is now called San Angelo. Uh, there's a city, uh, you maybe have heard of San Angelo, Texas. Well, mm-hmm. that was the vicinity where she did her first uh, appearances and uh, uh, and uh, she did a lot of the pre-evangelization with those particular peoples there. They were called the uh, Yumano, J-U-M-A-O, no, Yumano, J-U-M-A-N-O people, the tribe of the Yumano people. And um, they're still there in the vicinity of San Angelo. And so San Angelo has become a center for the promotion of the canonization, first she would have to be beatified, of Venerable Mary of Agreda, and they have a beautiful statue of her in the main plaza area down by the river. And so she would go there and she would teach them and they would be very happy with her teachings and such. And then she would disappear. She would just fade out of view, I guess, and leave. Then maybe a few days later she would come back to continue the catechesis and such. So one day the Franciscans who were sent from Querétaro, Mexico. Uh, they were sent up north to do this uh, evangelization of these peoples that they heard were there. And so they would show up at a particular, you know, tribal place where they lived, and they would say, we're here to teach you about Jesus and faith and Mary. And they said, yeah, well, we uh, kind of already know it. They would be praying the rosary and stuff. And they would say, wait a minute. So has has someone been here? They said, yeah, well, the lady in blue was here. And they said, the lady in blue was here. And what did she teach you? Oh, she taught us about Jesus and how he was crucified and how he redeemed us and opened the gates of heaven and how he loves us and, and his mother Mary. She, she taught us the rosary, and they would be praying the rosary, all the mysteries and stuff. And they would say, okay, look, who is this lady? They would say, you don't know about her? We thought that you sent her because they told, she told us that Franciscan missionaries would be arriving and we, would, uh, you, we were supposed to welcome you as we're doing right now with great love and affection and hoping that you would take us to the next level of our faith and such. But yeah, we already know the basics. And they said, but we never sent anybody that's impossible. How could someone ever come here? I mean, it's so dangerous to get here. No one even knows where here is. I mean, what are you talking about, this lady in blue? Draw a picture of her for us. Could you do that? And so they drew a picture of her, and then they would go, the Franciscans would go to some other Pueblo, let's say in Arizona or New Mexico, and they would hear the same thing. Well, the lady in blue was here, and she taught us this and that. Well, draw a picture. Well, it was always the same picture, and they recognized immediately that this is the habit that the Concepcionistas in Agreda wear. Um, Could it be that someone is actually bilocating to the new world and doing the pre-evangelization for us, preparing the way? So one of these Franciscans went back to Spain, visited Agreda, knocked on the door of the abbey, Sister answers the door, and he says, Sister, I'm so-and-so. There's this incredible thing going on in the new world. Is there, by chance, some sister here in this monastery that is so spiritualized that she might have the gift of bilocation and may be bilocating to the new world? Could that possibly be happening? Is there someone here who could possibly be doing that? And guess what? The sister who answered the door said, yes, there is someone here who is doing that, and that someone is me. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, so, and so the sister who answered the door was Mary of Agreda. She was the abbess, and she said, come on in. He said, the, the Franciscan said, sister, I have to sit down with you. I have to discuss this with you because this is so inspiring and so unbelievable. We have to get this recorded and down on the record. And so he sat down with her for hours and he talked with her and he said, okay, sister, I've been to the missions where you supposedly have been. Okay. Tell me something about this particular village. 
And so she said, yes, I've been there a number of times. I said, okay, describe the village for me. She described it perfectly. She said, now, when you enter the village, as you come into the village, there's an enormous rock. And sitting on top of that rock is a boy. He's handicapped, an Indian boy. And he throws flower petals down on everyone who comes into the village. That's like his little mission. And his, his name is this. And the Franciscan almost fell over. He said, Sister, that's exactly how it, how, how it is. I've seen the boy many times. I know him. That's his name. That's what he does. Now, Sister, when you get into the village, describe for me where the chief's where, where his dwelling place is, and describe that dwelling place. She said, oh, I've been in his tent many times. She said, he has a, a, like a teepee, like a tent. As you come in, it's not the first one, but it's the second one on your left. And she described it, and she described the chief. She, she said his name in the Indian language. She said a couple of other words in the Indian language. She said, sister, you were there, weren't you? She said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm the one who has been there. I've made about 400 trips to all the various Indian, not all of them, but, you know, some, some of them uh, in Texas, in New Mexico, in Arizona, and in California. He said, Sister, you don't know how inspiring this is going to be. I need you to write up a documented statement in my presence saying that you have been doing this by location, that God has been sending you there, and you have done the pre-evangelization because when I go back to the new world and I, so, and I show the future missionaries who are going to make this incredibly dangerous trip up north to the new world up there, it will inspire them so much because they are terrified. But when they hear that you have been sent by God to set up and do the pre-evangelization for them, they will realize that they also are being sent by God and they are under his protection. And you know, Dr. Tulin, that's exactly what happened. And you know who one of those missionaries were, was who went un, under the inspir, uh, inspiration of her documented statement saying that she's doing that? Uh, the newly canonized St. Junipero Serra, who did all the California missions. Yeah. He was one of them who, who went under the uh, inspiration that came from her mission to the New World. So the, the beauty of this is that if she is beatified and they're working on it super, super like hard to get her beatified and then canonized, if she is beatified and then canonized, she will be recognized as the first female evangelist of the United States. Wow. I mean, just think about that. I mean, it, it, you know, talk about women's, you know, mm-hmm. things, you know, we, they've been left behind, as it were, and, uh, you know, not spoken of, you know, because of being a woman or something like that. Well, here you have the full history of the evangelization of the United States, and guess what? A woman started it. She did the pre-evangelization. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, why don't I play the song? Yes, please. Because if the first one worked okay, I'm assuming that this one is going to be okay. I'll do it the same way. Mm-hmm. There's someone vacuuming outside my room. I'm staying at the seminar in Long Island, oh. and there's someone vacuuming. I'm hoping that that's going to not going to drown out the song. But anyway, let me just get to the song here. So the song begins with um, Deirdre arranged and uh, interpreted and arranged the song. So the song begins with this kind of beautiful mysterious uh, sounds of, of the various chords and stuff. And in the background you can hear the, the wind because when Mary Evagrida described her by location she described it as just the angels took her out of her cell up into the atmosphere and then she just was sitting on this like chair and it was flying across the, the ocean and, and it, she was watching the clouds and everything go by and there was this like beautiful sort of breeze that was uh, taking her along with the angels. So 
uh, in the beginning, you're going to hear uh, that sound, all those different sounds of wind chimes and, and of, wind, of breezes and of mysterious chords. And then comes Deirdre's beautiful voice singing the song. It's just... Okay, here it comes. Let me see that the uh, volume is up sufficiently. The first part's kind of quiet. Little children come to you. 
lady in blue. Hello? Yes. So, did you hear that? Yes, I did, and it was beautiful. Okay, good. I've just never... It's experimental, but... So, anyway, there there was a person who was uh, living in her father's gifts, you know, and what a blessing to a whole new world. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's how our father's gifts work. We never know exactly where they're going, but we know they're always good and they're, and they're always going somewhere that's going to be a blessing and a, and a healing. And, and anyway, Dr. Shula, I know that we're kind of running out of time here, but... Um, Did you want to uh, discuss anything else? I mean, I certainly have time if you do. I think, I think... No, I think I think we've covered you know just about enough as it is with uh, you know as a gift song and then an introduction as it were to uh, uh, the song "Sor Maria de Agreda," which I think uh, it was really good that uh, I was able to make that little presentation about her because mm-hmm. she's a, such a significant part of the history of our Catholic faith in this country, and um, very few people uh, realize uh, that she even existed, uh, never mind uh, the beautiful pre-evangelization work that she did for the mm-hmm. Franciscan missionaries coming up from uh, what is now Mexico. So, yeah, no, I think we're okay here now, Dr. Tulin. Okay. Um, well, um, before you close us in prayer, just make sure when you have some more songs that you get in touch with me again and we'll do another interview. Absolutely. I, I'm very grateful for that, Dr. Tuna. Thank you. Oh, I enjoy So it. let me give you and your listeners uh, our Father's blessing, okay? Okay. Heavenly Father, I call down your blessing on Dr. Tulin and her family and also on her family of listeners. I ask you, Father, to bless them this very day. Elevate their souls, Father, so that they live more in Jesus, risen from the dead, and they live in this passing world. And I ask you, Father, to bless them with the peace of Jesus. I ask you to protect, protect them during these difficult times, protect their souls, their hearts, their minds, uh, make them one with you as you are one with them. And I ask this In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. I want to thank you again, Father. Um, I always enjoy interviewing you. You're full of information that's both interesting and very pertinent. Um, You know, so, and I also enjoy the music. Okay. (laughs) Very much so. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you, Doc. And the feeling is mutual. You know, I look forward to speaking with you. Same here. Please say hello to all my other friends in Salt, and uh, hopefully we'll meet again soon. Yes. Okay, great, Doc. So God bless you, and thank you for the interview. Okay, thank you. Take care, Father. Okay, we'll see you now. Yep, bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.